Good afternoon, everyone, uh, from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we are very much pleased to uh, have this in order webinar between Pasca and Elsa from Pasca, we call it Pasca Plus, people learning, understanding, and sharing. And we are very, very happy to start the journey with Elsa in uh, uh, starting these conversations that we're going to have, series of conversations that we're going to have going forward on matters uh, higher education, particularly for today on quality assurance for online teaching. So some of you might wonder what is PASCA Plus? As I said, PASCA Plus, Plus is an acronym that stands for people learning, understanding and sharing. It is an innovative learning and social platform that uh, it brings together stakeholders in the evidence police uh, ecosystem uh, across countries in different uh, places that we operate. Uh, the idea again, is sharing and creating a network and community of practice uh, on areas of mutual, particularly in police and government in the continent. So <clears throat> we are very much to partner with ESA this endeavor where we are um, to engage conversations. Education is a public policy issue. We know what COVID has, how COVID has devastated higher education. And we feel it's important to share the research and evidence that is coming from what our collaborative work uh, in terms of how that can shape policy and conversations. I'm very much pleased to the panelists who made their time. Thank you so much for making the time to be here with us. Thankful for sharing your expertise, sharing your experiences. I do hope that those who are joining from the different parts of and the globe will also be willing to share uh, their inputs and lessons and questions to make this session very interactive and informative. So this, between PAC and, 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 and ESSA, this is one of the many series that we are starting. Uh, and uh, what we have dubbed our series beyond the COVID crisis using the evidence to understand the impact of the pandemic and build a better future of higher education in Sub-Saharan Africa. The again here is to use data and evidence for informed policy making with a particular focus on higher education uh, bearing in mind the devastating effects of COVID-19 and the challenges that higher education uh, systems are facing in the continent. This is, a, is the right step towards the right direction. We believe that having this conversation, bringing players together in these uh, very time engaging conversations is, is actually the, the right step to take. So as, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, us as our partner, but we want to appreciate once again our panelists. Uh, I know we have Dr. Moku from the AAU, also have, um, uh, I can't remember your name. Uh, uh, you are the commission from the Zimbabwe Commission for Education. I'll have to check uh, the name, uh, uh, but we are very much uh, happy again for you guys to be here and share experiences from Zimbabwe and Dr. Mokuku from the uh, AAU, even that AAU has an oversight across the continent. We want to also thank the participants who are on the participants who are joining from the different universities in different countries. And again, those are coming from Global North as well. Uh, feel free. And uh, with those remarks from Pasca, we are very happy again to have this conversation. And I hope this is the beginning of more engaging conversation going forward in shaping police discourse in the continent. So is that allow me to stop there, please? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zayenda. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Lucy Hedy, and I'm the CEO of Education Sub-Saharan Africa, or ESSA. Now, for those of you who don't know ESSA, we are a small NGO with a majority African team based in Africa and the UK, working to connect data and evidence on education from Africa with those who have the power to improve the system, including educators, policymakers, young people themselves. Our vision is one of high quality education in sub-Saharan Africa that allows young people to fulfill their ambitions and strengthen society. And our mission starts with universities and colleges, using data and evidence to drive dramatic improvement in outcomes for young people. We work across the student journey, looking at issues of access, quality and transition to work, 
And we also support researchers working on education, leveraging the power of Africa's universities and colleges to improve outcomes for young people at all levels of education. Now, we're here today to talk about the impact of the pandemic on universities, probably the biggest challenge to improving tertiary education in recent times. Every aspect of university life was affected from student welfare to research output uh, to the rapid switching to e-learning, which is central to the topic of today's conversation. Universities and policymakers did a tremendous job of responding to this challenge. However, many were and still are working in the dark due to a lack of data and research to understand the scale of the problem and effective solutions. So it's been an extraordinary privilege for ESSA to work alongside the Inter-University Council for East Africa and its members to collect and analyse empirical data that can inform practical action by university leaders and policymakers. And it has also been a great pleasure to work with the International Association of Universities and increase the power of our respective research results by presenting them together. Um, we're particularly delighted to be sharing this work in partnership with Pascal, an organisation that shares our values and has done so much to ensure that policy is evidence driven and based on trusted partnerships. Thank you to Pascal for your partnership in co-hosting this event and raising the profile of this critical topic bringing together the research with our fantastic panelists uh, from the Association of African Universities and the Honourable Minister from Zimbabwe. It's, um, I think this is where the magic happens when you bring that research and data together with people who have the real frontline experience of dealing with those challenges. And thank you to everyone joining here today. I really hope that you enjoyed the presentations and that the evidence and experience presented here inspires further action and collaboration. Thank you, and back over to you, Isaac. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anthony and Lucy. Really delighted to have everyone here to discuss um, effects of COVID-19 on our education. We move on, and um, now I'd love to invite Dr. Pauline Essa, who is the Director of Research and uh, Insights at Essa, to set the scene for this webinar. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much, Aizel. Um, yes, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited to set the scene for this fantastic webinar series that um, Pasga is organizing in collaboration with, with ESSA. Um, just before we go into the main presentations, really my mission here is to make you aware of um, the series that we're organizing, um, focusing on COVID, um, sort of as the first partnership that um, we're, we're engaging in. So. Um, as, as you've been told, and since you are here, you are aware that the first webinar will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on our um, universities in Sub-Saharan Africa and what the impact has been and how we can actually learn from that to improve um, uh, the quality of tertiary education in our institutions. So I won't give any further information. All will be revealed when Samuel and Trin give their presentations and, of course, uh, the panel discussion and, and your own involvement as, as the audience will be really appreciated. Um, but just to give you a, a flavor of what will be coming next, um, we'll be organizing some more of these um, webinars. And um, one of the topics we'll be looking at will be how to ensure inclusion and inclusivity in higher education in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, some of these issues we've picked on were prevalent before COVID, but in some cases, COVID has exacerbated um, the, the, the challenges that we already face. So really it's about, um, as highlighting work that PASGAR and ESSA have done in collaboration with our own other partners, um, just to bring that to the fore and to, to showcase um, what we're finding and, and to engage your own thoughts on how we can um, address some of these issues, existing solutions that may be available that uh, we can all discuss. And so, yeah, um, we hope you will join us for that webinar when um, information is circulated by our very brilliant communication um, teams. The other um, topic we've picked on to, to um, share with you all is one that focuses on institutional support um, and capacity strengthening in higher education institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa. What was the impact of the pandemic on, on this very important aspect of um, development in our institutions and, and strengthening um, institutional capacity, this capacity of lecturers? What was the impact of COVID and how did institutions mitigate um, 
these, these challenges and what more can be done to make sure that we're learning from the lessons of COVID and the opportunities that COVID provided to ensure that we don't go back to how things were being done, but rather we move forward to strengthen the quality of tertiary education in our institutions. Um, a third topic that um, will come in the future is about um, how can we create opportunities for higher education institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa to collaborate more at the national and at the regional and at international levels. So we know some of this is already happening, but obviously COVID brought in new di dimensions, new ways of partnering that maybe didn't exist beforehand. Obviously there's been hybrid partnerships and, and um, online uh, virtual partnerships. What are the pros and cons of those? And how did we navigate those spaces in our various institutions? And how can we move forward in terms of co-creating ways of engaging to further strengthen these partnerships and the research and outputs that come out of those. So these are, we think are really interesting topics coming out of our research that we want to engage with a range of stakeholders um, to address and, and to, to, to come up with some um, useful recommendations that will move from, to enable us to move from research to policy and to practical action. So in terms of who we are expecting to join these webinars, in fact, um, we welcome everyone and anyone who is interested in seeing higher education in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa um, moved to even greater heights. And so we're, we're expecting and hoping that even for today and in the future, that there are people from ministries and, and policymakers and actors from um, all over Africa and beyond Africa. So intergovernmental organizations, educators. So we, we're hoping councils of higher education, quality assurance agencies, um, rectors, vice chancellors um, will be here and to, to participate in these conversations. At the university level, the researchers, the teachers, the early career researchers, um, we wish that you would all come in and participate. This is for us, but it's also for you. Um, NGOs, civil society groups, um, industry, corporate, you're the ones employing our graduates from universities. We want to hear um, your voice as well and, and to contribute to these discussions. International partners in and outside Africa. We, we're working in partnership here. All that ESSA and PASCA do is about partnerships, working in collaboration, mutually beneficial partnerships, though I should stress, not top, not top-down partnerships, partnerships that really bring uh, benefit to both sides and lead to um, future advancement of our institutions. So please, if you know people who need to hear these messages and are not here, please prompt them when you see future advertisements for um. Uh, webinars and encourage them to join us and participate. In terms of what we'll be doing after these webinars, I mean, obviously for us, it's about getting the word out there, getting co-creation of solutions. And once we have those from these webinars, during the webinars and beyond, the plan is that we will share reports from these webinars with you all um, and then ensure that um, we can prepare policy briefs out of um, these, these um, reports as well, because we know our stakeholders um, receive and absorb um, evidence in different ways. And so we'll be targeting policy briefs for our uh, policy stakeholders, uh, but also we hope that this will generate more increased awareness of um, cross-continental knowledge sharing and, and learning that we can all learn from each other through these engagements um, to really tackle issues that we face in higher education institutions and also the recommendations that are coming out of these conversations will be used to advance um, our own universities and yeah, ensure that we are producing quality um, graduates that will come in and, and work in the, in the various workforces and really uplift our continent. So that's it. I hope that encourages you to join us um, in the future. And yeah, I'm really excited to see what we can do together today. Thank you very much. And back to you, Aizo. Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, and really grateful that you highlighted that we're not just sharing findings, but together we want to um, create solutions that we will work for uh, young people. Thank you. We move on and uh, I would love to invite Samuel Akiapong, the manager at um, ESSA, and also Trin from um, International um, Association of Universities, who will talk us through uh, some research findings from COVID-19 studies. Uh, over to you, Samuel and Trin. Thank you very much, Aizo. Um, 
for the opportunity. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Samuel Nyakon Japon, as was mentioned by um, ISO. And um, today I'm going to walk you through um, one of the studies that we conducted uh, with IECA on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education institutions in East Africa. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected um, all aspects of modern life um, and the higher education um, sector has not been left alone. The pandemic has created um, a lot of rigid, um, an, an unprecedented test to the rigidity and the quality of higher education systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, I'm going to present um, or showcase the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the quality um, assurance systems in higher education in East Africa. And I'm gonna draw from the evidence that was generated um, from a partner um, study that was conducted by the Inter-University Council for East Africa and then Education Sub-Saharan Africa. The focus will be on teaching, learning, uh, and also exams and assessment. The study was conducted in the East African community with focus on six countries, Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, and also Uganda. We used um, an online survey tool to collect data from 1,658 participants. And um, this include, included students, faculty members or lecturers, um, university officials, and then also regulators of higher education across the six countries. It will interest you to know, or it's important for me to mention that the study was conducted within the period of April to June, 2021. This is a breakdown of the responses that we got from the study. Um, in general, uh, in total, we got 1,658 uh, responses from students, faculty members, principals and vice chancellors of universities, and also um, academic registrars. As you all know, the COVID-19 facilitated the swift transition from face-to-face um, -face learning to online learning. So in the study, we tried to understand the speed at which universities were able to migrate from online, from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning. And um, the results indicated that uh, out of the universities that we engage with, 39% of private universities and 18% of public universities were able to immediately transition into online learning. Other, un other um, universities are also were able to transition in various times, um, like uh, within one to three months, as well as as, as long as six to nine months for them to transition. We try to understand how they are able to migrate most of the academic programs, as well as their students onto these platforms. And our evidence show that um, 45% uh, of private universities and also 20% of public universities were able to migrate 90% of their academic programs. In similar fashion, 36% of private universities were able to migrate 90% of their students. This is compared to 20% of public universities being able to migrate 90% of their students. This shows that most of the public universities were a bit ready compared, most of the private universities were a bit ready compared to the public universities. We try to understand the factors that hindered the transition or the speed of the transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning. And we realized that um, there are a lot of challenges that university faced and um, picking data from university chancellors and then also registrars we realized a general lack of digital skills uh, and also the infrastructure for this transition. Also, there was the lack of policy in order to aid this transition. Data from the vice chancellors showed that generally there was sentiment around the clear, having clear guidance and then also uh, clear guidance on accreditation and also how to conduct uh, online learning. And this was coming from uh, in, in uh, not much clearer guidelines from regulators who were regulating higher education within the region. Digging deeper to understand the student experiences, we gathered information on um, how the challenges that students and faculty members faced 
during this period of the pandemic. We also, the results indicated that both faculty members and students lacked the needed skills in order to transition. Also, there was general um, lack of um, or what we call the digital um, digital divide that was created by the COVID-19 pandemic. And most students asserted this to creating inequality in learning. Also, faculty members indicated that they required more time to prepare and conduct uh, online classes or lessons compared to in-person uh, classes. On examination and assessment, our results indicated that also there was a general lack of skills and equipment to undertake online uh, or remote examination. Also, on quality issue, we realized that both students and faculty members raised concern about the difficulty in upholding the integrity of online examination. And um, the a general sentiment that also came out from the study was that um, the, there was lack of, um, like, let's say, um, digital divide, or there was a the system failure when it comes to conducting and participating in uh, online or remote examination. We try to understand how these, this pandemic or the COVID-19 pandemic affected the quality assurance or the quality delivery of education within the sub-region. And we, we ask questions around how institutions and regulators try to maintain the quality of teaching and learning. Our results indicated that, and we're picking from students and faculty members, most institutions within the region trained their students and faculty members on how to conduct and also participate in online learning uh, and uh, teaching and learning. Also, generally, most universities provided bundles or internet for their students and faculty members, uh, as well as providing them with equipment in order to be able to undertake online learning. Sadly, close to 40% of faculty members indicated that their institution didn't support them in order to transition or provide the needed capacity in order for them to transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning. Similar to uh, that of students, 32% indicated that they received no support from their students. We try to dig deeper to understand the views of regulators in ensuring quality standards. And 66% uh, of the regulators that we inter interacted with or responded to the survey indicated that they have developed guidelines in order to aid the smooth transition uh, into online learning. However, the results in the uh, asking questions around guidelines on examination, we realized that the, none of the regulators that we interacted with had developed guidelines for uh, conducting examination via online platforms. Looking forward, we ask students and faculty members how they see the future of education to be. And generally, most students prefer the blended learning approach. This was also recommended by the faculty members who, uh, who suggested blended learning approach for the future of education. In conclusion, um, the study revealed that there wasn't clear guidelines on conducting online teaching and learning assessment. Also, the region showed great resilience in transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning. And as, you, as has been mentioned earlier on, there was a general lack of digital skills and infrastructure to, uh, to um, deploy online teaching and learning. And there was a general concern regarding the integrity of uh, conducting examination and assessment online. Blended learning, as was mentioned also, uh, is the preferred approach for students in order to engage in future education. Thank, uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I'll pause here and then also um, turn the mic over to my colleague, Aizo, for us to continue. Thank you. Aizo. Thank you so much, um, Samuel. Um, I'll allow Trim to also uh, share with us uh, research findings from IAU. Thank you very much, uh, Aisil. And first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and share with you uh, the work that we've been done doing at IAU. And uh, I also want to congratulate Pascal and uh, Essa 
on this new webinar series that I find extremely important and interesting. And I'm looking forward to the, to the other chapters of the series as well. So let's dive into it. Just to explain very briefly, my name is Trina Jensen and I work for the International Association of Universities. It's an NGO that was created more than 70 years ago by UNESCO and we are working out of the headquarters in Paris, but we work together with our members, uh, which is around 600 institutions around the world in several countries. And really the backbone of our work is to generate international collaboration across regions. We work on different areas, among others, leadership, interna internationalization, sustainable development, and digital transformation. And digital transformation is the area that I am leading and that I'm going to talk a little bit about here in, in this session. So <clears throat> before we, work, we move into the, um, the research that we conducted uh, in relation to the impact of COVID on higher education, I wanted to take you back in time, make you travel a little bit because IAU actually conducted a global survey on the state of digital transformation. Uh, the data collection took place uh, end of 2018 and then into the middle of 2019. And we published the result of that survey really in January 2020, just a few months prior to the beginning of the pandemic. And as you can imagine, that is a, a very difficult time to publish a report on the, the state of digital transformation as the world just a few months later was about to completely change. But the reason why I bring it into here today is that I wanted to show you just a few figures about how the situation was at the global level before the pandemic hit us. And we had, and I'm, that's the only slide that I bring in from this survey. If you're interested in learning more, it's freely available on our website. But we did have a question around the use of online learning and blended and learning. And as you can see here on the slide, we had almost a third of the institution responding to our survey saying that they offered no online courses at that time. Uh, 43 offered up to 20%, but I mean, not necessarily, but up to 20% of their courses online. And only very few, up to 8%, said that they offered more than half of their courses online. And for this, it also includes those universities that are actually open universities and offering more or less all uh, courses online. So you can see that at just a few months prior to the pandemic, online learning was not very common among the higher education community. When we look at the same uh, data, but for blended and hybrid learning, it is very similar, although it was a little bit more used. So it is definitely certain that the pandemic has changed the way that we integrate remote teaching and learning in our teaching, yeah, in teaching and learning. So, a bit like uh, Samuel was explaining, IAU also conducted, we did two surveys on the impact of the pandemic uh, on higher education. Our first one in 2020 was really at the outset of the pandemic, and then a more comprehensive survey that we did in 2021 and collected the data between February and June, so really one year into the pandemic. And there we have only, I mean, our surveys, um, in contrast to the one Samuel was explaining, we were reaching out to institutions asking for only one reply by institution, so an institutional reply. And we got almost 500 replies for some 112 countries that allowed us to kind of look at the data, of course, globally, but also by region. Here, I just brought in a few examples of the data that we saw in this survey, but we do see that 89% of the responding higher education institutions were now offering teaching and learning. Only 11% one year into the pandemic said that they did not offer a remote teaching and learning. So there has been a huge increase, as you see, around the world in, to the extent to which that they make use of these um, alternative modes of uh, uh, deliver, uh, teaching and learning delivery. We also looked at to what extent institutions were able to reach out to their student body. And in the table, you'll see at the same time, the, 
the global numbers that institutions are saying that they reach out to 86% of their students. But when you look at the, the breakdown by region, you do see a difference here, for example, between Europe reporting 92% and then in Africa where institutions in average are reporting uh, reaching out to 74% of the students. However, when we break it down and look at how many of the in institutions are actually reaching out to their full student body through online or remote learning, uh, the numbers are much lower, but you will see that in Europe, we still have almost 40% of the institutions declaring that they reach out well to their students uh, through these means of teaching and learning, whereas in Africa, the, the number is a bit lower with only 14%. However, then when we shift it around and say how many are reaching out to less than 50%, uh, we see that it's only very few institutions uh, in Europe and it is still a quarter of the institutions in Africa. So this is telling us something about the access and the the, I think Samuel was referring to the digital divides, and this is a reality in this new world where we are making more use of digital technologies, that it requires a certain infrastructure to be able to ensure that we reach out to the students and to ensure that the quality is there. We also had a more general questions around the use of digital tools and here because it's so similar across the regions I only brought in the global uh, numbers, as you see, uh, no matter what uh, criteria that we put in our uh, quest in our question here use of online learning use of digital con communication to communicate with students virtual exchanges collaborative learning use of uh, LMS learning management systems open educational resources and learning analytics throughout the scale, most of the institutions were reporting an increase in the use of these digital tools. Now, of course, we have to keep in mind that this increase, of course, was forced by the pandemic and the restrictions that were in place. So I think that right now we are at a point in time where we hope that we are moving out of the pandemic and where we stand um, at a crossroad in terms of how do we want to shape the digital future from here? What can we learn from the experience during the pandemic in order to shape how we wish to make use, not by force, but by choice, digital tools moving forward? And here we are currently conducting a follow-up, a qualitative follow-up project to our quantitative uh, analysis or a survey that we did where we are asking uh, a, a limited number of institutions to provide more information about how they now see the, the progress from here and forward uh, and how they want to shape the future of teaching and learning. And I just brought in four examples. The analysis is not yet over, it's in, in progress, but I thought it would be very interesting to share with you as well to what extent that the experience and the visions forward also differ from one institution to another, meaning that there are different options as we shape the future of teaching and learning. The first uh, example here on the screen is from a university in, in Pakistan, who is also referring to a new integration of collaboration with online education platforms in order to open up the education offer and uh, the encouragement to teachers uh, to uh, get certification in online teaching and learning to better understand uh, international trends um, and to be better equipped to teach online. So that's one example. From Canada, we also see very similar to what Samuel was presenting in his survey that students after this experience, this has also generated expectations in terms of the future um, uh, possibilities or flexibility in the learning path so that students are asking for more, um, I mean, are, rich, uh, are expecting a more flexible choice that could be, of course, face-to-face, -face, but also uh, hybrid or online learning classes. And uh, the institution in Canada is more uh, also explaining that this also impact the way that they structure uh, their programs, um, potentially offering more certificates and micro programs, uh, experimental learning and more focus on uh, research or entrepreneurship. So we really do see that 
the impact of the pandemic will have a long-term effect on teaching and learning. Here we have another example from Lesotho, where there is focus on the digital infrastructure, reminding us that the, the ideals and the objectives in terms of making use of digital uh, technologies were already part of the strategic plan of the university prior to the pandemic, but that the pandemic actually demonstrated that although that the ambitions and the will is there, it still requires a certain uh, investment in infrastructure that allows it to make it a, a reality. So, so the, the, the context is also shaping the opportunities and, and the possibilities. We also have another example from Brazil that I found interesting to, to bring in here as well, because we're focusing, of course, on online and remote teaching and learning. But here in this university, they had the conversation. They also see demands from students, but they have decided to shift back to what they believe would be the best mode for them and return more or less 100% to face-to-face -to -face learning. So I thought that these four example gives you an, uh, a picture of the different ways forward and to what extent that this um, experience of the pandemic will lead to a multiple way of actually shaping the future of teaching and learning. So when we are here today for the question uh, about quality, I think that it is important to establish that the pandemic has certainly impacted teaching and learning. And I think that we all agree that quality must be at the center. And I think that it is regardless of the mode of learning. It should be whether it's face-to-face, -face, online or blended, quality must be at the center. I think we also need to acknowledge that in the emergency remote teaching and learning that was set up immediately after the pandemic, universities did their best to ensure that the education was not disrupted, but it does not necessarily mean that that type of teaching and learning is the best way of offering uh, online learning. So I think that right now we're in a time where it's important to draw on lessons learned during the pandemic in order to take informed decision about the way forward. I think that we have established, and that's also what Samuel was saying in his presentation, that there is a continuous need for capacity building. One thing is around tools, uh, infrastructure, how to use them, but also in terms of understanding the difference in terms of pedagogy when it comes to online or face-to-face -face learning. We cannot just move from one space to another and implement the same modes of learning. So in that context, I think that quality assurance frameworks and system may need to be adapted, but I think it's important that they remain the same for the program overall and not specific to the mode of learning. So to sum up, I think that we need to strive to enhance the online and blended offer the, informed by the lesson learned as just explained. I think that it's important that universities continues to invest in the building of capacities, both for online and blended modes of learning. And uh, it's, it's certainly important for the quality to implement, review and adapt quality assurance mechanisms. I also take the opportunity here to make a little publicity for a recent publication that we, we launched uh, together with the Open University uh, of Catalonia in, in Spain. Um, it is a very practical handbook uh, where the professors of the Open Universities explained in very simple uh, manners uh, through, I think, a, a series of 12 chapters how online education is different from face-to-face -face education. So really an easy accessible guide in order to understand the differences between face-to-face -face and online education. And I think that's another way of as well contributing to ensuring that the quality remains uh, high beyond uh, the pandemic. Finally, I want to invite you all to take part in these conversations about how higher education is transforming. And IAU is very pleased to again be able to convene an in-person event. We are meeting uh, at the, university, uh, the Col university College Dublin in Ireland this year from the, in October. So I hope that some of you will have the opportunity to join and continue the conversation there. 
Thank you very much. Back to you, Isel. Thank you so much, Samuel and Trin. Wonderful uh, research presentations on impact of COVID-19 on eye education. Um, I'll hand over to Dr. Pauline Gimwa, uh, who is the Professional Development and Training Manager at uh, PASCA uh, to manage the panel discussion and the Q&A session. Thank you, and over to you, Pauline. Uh, thank you very much, Aiso, and uh, thank you everyone so far. We've, come, we've done very well. Uh, we've got to that stage where we invite our panelists and uh, with us uh, we have highly experienced uh, experts in this area of uh, quality assurance and higher education. So allow me to briefly introduce our two panelists and I'll start with Dr. Violet Makuku, um, who is um, an African higher education quality assurance at um, and workshops coordinator and project officer at the Association of African um, Universities. I believe that is very familiar to all of us who are in the higher education space. Um, AAU is located in Accra, Ghana. Uh, Dr. Makuku holds a PhD in quality assurance in uh, university education from the University of uh, South Africa in uh, UNISA. Among her many contributions, particularly in this area of quality assurance, is that she's been part of the working group of higher education quality assurance experts, personnel, and administrators who kickstarted the harmonization of quality assurance and accreditation for tertiary uh, universities, uh, tertiary institutions in Africa in 2016. And uh, during the COVID 19, she was very active in organizing numerous practical oriented quality assurance in online teaching and learning. She held workshops and uh, that kind of training. Um, the next panelist, um, Nick Quarry, um, highly experienced um, expert in quality assurance is Dr. Hudson Kwadanyi, who is the director of academic and is institutional audits at the Zimbabwe Council of Higher Education, um, a position he's held since October, 2021. And before joining Zimbabwe Council of Higher Education, he was the director of quality assurance at Lupane State University in Zimbabwe. His, many, his main responsibility at the council is to coordinate auditing of internal quality assurance systems of 20 universities in Zimbabwe. He holds a PhD in higher education administration major and geography minor from uh, the University of Arizona. He has vast training expertise in areas such as quality assurance in education, public policy analysis, institutional marketing, strategic, strategic planning, and change and conflict management. Um, dear uh, participants, we encourage you to put in your questions uh, for both the panel and the presentations that have just been done in the Q&A. Um, I'll go straight to our panelists. And uh, the first uh, question is that I'd like us, I'd like you to uh, make reflections on what has been uh, presented we had Trun come in with an international perspective of what, of what was happening globally. And then uh, Samuel has brought us closer home to uh, present uh, some of the work that they did with Inter University Council of East Africa. So I'd like our two panelists to give a response uh, to these findings uh, in light of what was happening in your respective universities. And uh, they say ladies first. So I want to give this opportunity to Violet to come in first, and then uh, Dr. Kodanyi will follow. Over to you, Violet. Uh, thank you very much. Um, allow me to stand on the protocols already uh, observed. And uh, my name has been introduced already. So for me, what is very interesting, you know, we are at continental level. And like you said, uh, the wall of 2020, 
I did uh, a lot of workshops uh, related to uh, quality assurance of online teaching and learning, quality assurance of uh, research under um, the lockdowns. And um, as I did those things, uh, I realized that uh, a lot was happening. And the good thing is that these uh, uh, research results really confirmed some of the things uh, uh, that I met there. Uh, why uh, did I get inspired to do the online teaching and uh, uh, online teaching and learning as well as online research uh, workshops? So when I started attending the the workshops which were offered by other organizations, uh, synchronous on asynchronous and uh, synchronous uh, teaching and learning uh, support, there are two things which I noted. And I was very much concerned uh, during those uh, online uh, workshops and uh, what have you, I normally deliberately ask it. So what about quality assurance issues? Nobody responded to me. I asked it also, how about the teaching and learning of uh, practical oriented disciplines? Nobody responded to me. And those two gaps, I knew that at continental level, as a quality assurance expert and workshops coordinator, as well as facilitator, I needed to run with them in order to plug those two gaps. So I ran workshops on uh, teaching of uh, practical oriented disciplines and quality assurance. And I realized one or two things. People knew about the applications or platforms that they could use, but maybe they were beyond their reach, you see. Uh, also, some of the platforms and applications were peculiar in certain regions. For example, they were only developed for India. And when you are in Africa, you try to use them, you wouldn't be able to. There were also institutions which were ignorant about even the existence of uh, uh, things like simulations, micro labs, and so on. And uh, those are the things which I concentrated on. Regarding quality assurance, I realized that uh, in terms of for research, for example, most institutions do not subscribe, for example, to the survey monkey for their students and staff. And that really affected research in institutions because now with lockdowns, you can't go about with uh, a physical questionnaires. In terms of teaching and learning, rightly said by the two presenters, People lacked the skill on how to go about it. And so as AAU, that's when we started coming in. There's something I want to tell you, which is funny, very funny. For the national accreditation bodies throughout the continent, you know, there are institutions which offered, uh, it, it was presented earlier by one of the two presenters, that they offered few uh, programs online, pick that up. There are some which offered it for a whole faculty or a part of a, a faculty in certain programs. That's number one. Number two, do you know that we have, um, please, I may miss its pronunciation. It's a real narration, but it's a, 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 a um, an association of uh, distance education institutions like the Zimbabwe Open University, uh, the Open University of Nigeria, the Tanzania Open University, uh, Tunisia Open University. So where am I leading you to? When uh, the national accreditation bodies responded that they did not have uh, the uh, standards and uh, the way to do the uh, assessments, uh, for me, it's only that they didn't know where to start from because of the confusion of COVID-19. So as the Association of African Universities, I now did a webinar on 6th July to tell them of the existing tools, the existing standards 
which they could take on board. So this included the toolkits for this uh, 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 open and distance uh, learning. I now advise them also to look into the programs which they had already accredited, which were online, because nothing would be peculiar to moving uh, and using online uh, standards which have been generated to manage those uh, uh, um, courses which were now coming on board to just join what has been going on. So the physical presence, and what is worrying me now is that institutions, some institutions want to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. Why do they want to go back to face-to-face uh, -face with the fourth industrial revolution? It's also affecting Africa. I'm just winding off to stop so that maybe I can come in later on. So you find with the fourth industrial revolution, it's affecting everyone. The banks are automating, industry is automating, agriculture is automating, engineering is automating. So when they, uh, they go back to face to face, can't you see the disservice that is going to happen? And what will happen to the investment? Well, that Amako, I, I would like you to put that on hold because mm -hmm. it's an important point that you're bringing about. Okay. And uh, we'll come back to it and allow uh, Dr. Kodanyi to come in and give us what was happening in Zimbabwe okay. uh, in relation to the findings that have just been presented. Um, thank you very much, uh, Doc. I'm going to put off my camera so that uh, probably I'll be more audible. Thank you very much for the presentation, which are very clear or which were very clear. I'll start uh, directly with uh, Jensen's presentation. Um, good strategy of comparing pre-COVID and COVID period. I think this is very clear that uh, COVID had an impact in terms of our ecosystem of teaching. Apparently, Zimbabwe universities, some of them did also learn from others, like the use of Coursera courses, which Coursera uh, gave free of charge. I know Lupani State University did quite a lot. In terms of what Lesotho did, the challenges of infrastructure, it's very clear that uh, we had the same ambitions in our universities, but of course, the expenses related to infrastructure are noted and applicable in our situation. Let me focus on the issues which Jensen raised, that quality should be at the center. Very, very important, because if we are not careful in our higher education, we might simply have what Jensen calls emergency remote teaching and learning is not the same as online teaching. I think in her slides, that was very clear that if we are not careful, just having a computer and internet and think that we are giving online, that might be misleading. Because when we come to examinations, we had a, a few challenges where universities might have said, we are now giving online examination. On closer examination, you find that it was just a take home. So those were some of uh, the challenges. And most importantly, one thing I want to emphasize from Jensen's presentation, is the idea that we need to adapt quality assurance practices of the traditional teaching and online so that they are integrated. And a number of quality assurance agencies have already alluded to that. If you look at Ireland, the quality and the qualification Ireland, they say the two have to be integrated so that the quality assurance of the two systems are not different. And finally, what the Asian Pacific economic uh, cooperation countries are doing, that this should be integrated. And as Zoom chair in our country, we are also trying to integrate the quality assurance systems of online as well as the traditional, and that has been very helpful. And in terms of the results, the results appear very similar. Zoom chair, Zimbabwe Council of Higher Education did carry out research to find out what was happening. And we found that the challenges are more or less the same. And we did a lot of training with a lot of webinars to try to capacitate our staff and our students, and also to encourage universities 
to provide assistance to bundle data, uh, data bundles to our students. Otherwise, in the interest of time, I'll wait here for come later. Thank you very much. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Dr. Kodani. Uh, these are very um, uh, interesting insights that are coming in. What I like about both of you is that you're combining what the findings uh, of the two studies show with what was happening in your own respective uh, institutions. Now, both your organizations are charged with issues to do with policy. I know uh, Africa uh, AAU, you sit at the uh, continental level where you oversee um, what is happening and make and facilitate policy dialogues and debates. And um, in Zimbabwe, as the regulatory body, you also expected to make policy recommendations. So to both of you, and starting with um, Dr. Kwadani, I would like you to um, give us uh, an indication of some of the lessons that were emerging and what policy recommendations that um, you think uh, are emerging that can be presented to ensure quality uh, in e-learning in e practices. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Um, probably let me briefly go through what Zimchia did just to try to bring in the way forward. That uh, training of students and staff was done, provision of data bundle in terms of encouragement. Zimchia also promoted the evaluation of online teaching as a policy that we need to develop instruments. And those instruments, while we are trying to evaluate, they are also teaching tools. So the instruments are already uh, in place at university level and also at Zimchia level, where we can look at globally our university. So the evaluation system of, of online learning and teaching is already in place. What we have also done is that um, we now have regular webinars so that our uh, instructors do not grow up in the dark. They are well informed at discipline level. So these are not generic, these are specific. As I present, we are now finalizing our quality assurance systems for online as well as uh, traditional combined operation. If we look at what other continents are doing, for example, let's look at uh, um, Southeast Asia, where Australia is also included. They do have best practices. And as Zimchia, as Zimbabwe, we are now trying to benchmark, adapt and adopt the good practices not just from those, if we look at the African standards, they do have a section where they talk about how can we improve quality for online distance teaching. And lastly, we need to remember that online teaching is distance teaching. Therefore, the pedagogics of teaching has to be understood. Our lecturers should understand what does it mean to teach at a distance. And therefore our designs should take note of that. Thank you. Uh, very useful uh, policy recommendations there, and I'm happy that uh, you've already instituted some of them in Zimbabwe. Um, Dr. Makuku, at AAU, uh, you are the regional um, facilitators of policy dialogues, and as a quality assurance expert, what are the, well, what policy dialogues have been taking place? And what are you recommending so that uh, you can improve quality assurance? And I'm particularly um, interested in picking from where uh, Dr. Kudanyi has, has left concerning um, support for the educators, the lecturers in terms of skills acquisition. So if you could take just um, three minutes to tell us what is happening at that space and zero in into what is happening in supporting the faculty. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, allow me to start from uh, what we are doing to support the, the faculty, but um, we are not supporting the faculty alone. We are also supporting the uh, quality assurance agencies at national level 
uh, mind you, we are also a continental body, uh, the implementing arm of uh, higher education in Africa for the African Union. So capacity building uh, through um, online teaching and learning uh, workshops is one thing that uh, we have really embarked on. And uh, I see it, um, we do it at international level, and we also do it at institutional level, because what happens is when you have an international uh, workshop, uh, those people will go back to their institutions and report on what we will have done with them. So we go now to do the institutional. Before Dr. Kwandai left, uh, AAU uh, took them through, uh, through the big blue button and uh, uh, some other uh, online teaching and learning uh, tools. I want to say that also we continue to have uh, webinars which help, but the key issue which has been highlighted by everybody so far is the need for the skill. So the AAU has made a deliberate move to do workshops of hand holding. Do you know most people just have uh, the skill to join the Zoom platform. But to create their personal Zoom platform, they can do that in the interest of time. Allow me to move to what the AAU has done along the line of uh, policy dialogues and so on. So we are looking at not only the digitalization of institutions, but also the quality assurance agencies like Zimche they also need to digitalize because everybody needs to walk the talk and then they can go the blended mode so that even if they are doing institutional assessments or evaluations for accreditation, part of it, they ask institutions to upload documents and so on. We had dialogue with vice chancellors. We asked them of their challenges we asked them also of their suggestions and we did wrote policy briefs, but everybody pointed to the issue of uh, infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, we can talk about quality assurance, but what is at the core of everything is the quality of infrastructure. Some had infrastructure well and running, others needed to uh, do some renovations even with internet services is the same, but at a national level and at continental level, we had dialogue with the ministries responsible for ICT and communications, as well as finance, so that they can expand into the rural areas, the internet infrastructure and uh, ICT services. So that's what we have done. And can I do a bit of recommendations? before with your you have permission. one minute to do that uh, one that minute term. yes so institutions should be involved in the national research and education networks i can give more information later in the interest of time there's very little i can say about those ones but for regional networks also we have ubuntu net for southern and eastern africa when you use one account for many countries from where they can draw internet services, it becomes between 70 to 90% cheaper. The last one, the blended approach is here to stay. I talked about industry automating. So if we drop the online, which enables us to transfer those skills as we use it for teaching, where will our graduates go and work? without ICT skills and internet services, knowledge and skills. I thank you. Uh, very important uh, points that you have made there, and I like your recommendations. And Anne Rens were very instrumental in the sudden shift. And here in Kenya, where we sit, we saw Kenneth really working in partnership with universities. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you. Universities need to be very active in the entrance, the various entrance in their respective university uh, countries. Um, thank you very much, participants. I'm looking at the Q and A, and you have lots and lots of questions that are coming in. 
Um, we will try our very best, but time is not on our side. So I request our panelists and presenters to be very brief in responding to the questions to see how much you can cover. So I will start with a question that has come in to Samuel. How do you see the role of blended learning in widening access to higher education? That's a question from Samuel Asare to uh, Samuel Ajimpo. Over to you, Samuel. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, I think blended learning is the next um, or the future of tertiary education um, assistance now. And uh, it will provide um, students the opportunity for in-person classes as well as uh, engaging online classes. And what it does is that, you know, the future of the labor market is also moving to a, a space where, you know, we use digital system. So students, the role that the blended learning will play uh, in the future of students is that it provides students with the needed skills uh, in order to be relevant in the labor market, as well as um, have the full benefits of education. Um, I hope I'm able to answer your questions some more. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Samuel. Um, there's an interesting question that ties up with what uh, Violet was talking about, the quality of infrastructure and, uh, and, and quality assurance issues. And this is a question that is uh, to train by Elias. How do you ensure quality if infrastructure and appropriate resources are not provided? Over to you, Trin. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. I think that it's an interesting one because I think that I fully agree with Samuel saying that blended learning, I believe that it's the future. I also believe that when we when we decide how we are going to to provide teaching and learning in the future, I don't think that by default it has to be online. I think that we have to see what we can do, taking into consideration the constraints of the infrastructure available. So for example, we had uh, panelists in some of our webinars from South Africa saying that for uh, students, it is also very important to be on campus, that it is an equalizer in terms of uh, being together on campus and exchanging with students. So I don't necessarily believe that everything needs to be online. However, some things could potentially be online. We could imagine that instead of having um, uh, huge uh, rooms with lectures, that the lectures could be recorded and disseminated with students and viewed from different spaces. It could even be from computers uh, on the campus for students that are in need of access to data on campus, but could also be viewed at other times. Here, there is an opportunity to actually allow students to review the lecture several times to listen. So I think it's about seeing where can we actually do things differently in a way that can contribute to enhancing um, education, the teaching and learning experience. And I think that it's absolutely okay that it's not the same in one university from another, because I think it's extremely important to take into consideration uh, the, the possibilities and the means available. So if students, if we know that they do not have the devices or data needed for online education, in that case, I think that the quality would be higher by bringing them to camp, uh, campus. If we know that students do have this uh, possibility, then let's see what can be done remotely. Everything does not need to be in an online space either. It could be group work outside of campus, on assignments, et cetera. So there are different possibilities. I think it's a matter of taking into consideration the contest, context, the infrastructures, and then take informed decisions about what is the best solutions for my institutions, considering our constituencies, the possibilities of our students. But yes, of course, I hope and I work for that that we will all have the means in the future to explore the potential of digital um, technologies. Thank you, Trin. Uh, I want to direct the next question to Dr. Kwedani. Uh, this is a question from Ruby Kodom, who is asking what factors are considered when certifying online programs. Over to you, uh, Dr. Terry. Thank you very much for the for the question. Probably, let me start by acknowledging that um, 
my previous university, we got a lot of assistance to train during COVID from the Association of African Universities, as Dr. Makudu alluded to. And then the university in Lupane ended up also helping other universities, which was very useful. And also, of course, uh, Zimchia has also started accrediting programs using online facilities, which is in line with uh, digital uh, use of information and technology. Uh, what factors to be considered? Let me say, first of all, content quality. We have to look at content quality. We have to look at the uh, learning objectives alignment to content. The nature of feedback, which is being provided, we should be online. The motivation being provided to students, the design and the usability of the online systems in place. Is the, the design compatible with what is expected in uh, online teaching. Accessibility is very, very important. And of course, we also have to look at uh, the issues of uh, instructional design. We need specialists to look at how do we design our instruction. It's very, very important. That's why earlier on I talked about, first and foremost, we should know that this is distance teaching. And the, in terms of design, do we design for a student who is alone? In terms of how do we structure the content? Is this simplified to the extent that the student could understand? And of course, technology. What type of technology do we use? So if this could be designed, and we can even design the questionnaire to find out whether these attributes I've talked about are being meant. And of course, we also have to look at the best practices of how these are to be looked at, I'm sure we should be able to meet the subtraction levels for students. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that response. There's, there are questions around uh, examinations and allow me to combine them in the interest of saving time. So um, I, I would like uh, any one of you to respond to the question of examinations, online examinations and ensuring quality um uh in ensuring quality in of offering examination online anyone um who can respond to that uh yes. probably oh go ahead dr go go ahead, ahead. Thank you. okay thank you um the issue of examinations in terms of academic integrity of exams is a, a contentious issue however a number of uh, technology um, uh, technologies have been put in place in terms of monitoring the student who is writing so that um, the systems are in place to see who is actually writing. However, with all that technology, other experts are saying it is also advisable to have students come and write on campus so that we know exactly who is writing for who even in developed countries with all the technology, they found that cheating in exams may not be eliminated. Therefore, having face-to-face -face exams with students is also recommended. Thank you. Um, uh, Violet, did you want to say something? Did you yes. To I just wanted to add that uh, there's a big difference uh, between uh, 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 assessment and uh, its credibility in Africa as opposed to the developed world. Here in Africa, you know, for many years, we have been rejecting uh, this mode of uh, uh, teaching and learning simply because we were aware of uh, our incapacity in terms of uh, 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 maintaining the credibility of the examination system. But what do I want to say right now? Uh, whatever we have cannot be uh, 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 foolproof. We have uh, proctoring, you are checking um, eye movement, you are checking the water, but I've realized that the many examples of uh, academic dishonesty I have seen uh, would require, for example, somebody writing an exam overseas, the uh, developed countries, they've uh, uh, had a face recognition and that has helped which we may not have here because we can't afford as uh, institutions. The other one is uh, problematic. You can do, be doing the proctoring, but somebody surrounding themselves here on the table, you can see me. You can see me writing and typing, but 
my eyes can quickly go up to the left and down, even if you say you monitor, it's not foolproof. What I'm uh, also saying is, we may have some free, we should talk about open online resources before we conclude the whole thing, because most of the people are just thinking that everything that is valuable, you need to pay for it. We have open access resources. And this is one thing which can highly and make a difference in terms of the quality of education we can have. All that Dr. Kwandai has raised in terms of uh, uh, quality um, uh, uh, materials and what have you, we already have examples of good open access. Please, just before, I want to say that there are grants. There are grants since COVID-19. You know the Bible says my people perish because of lack of knowledge, grants on ICT infrastructure, grants on improving internet services. But the issue is, do you even know the grants exist? Do you even know who is offering those grants? Because the major excuse in Africa is finances. Why don't you think of third stream income uh, rather than waiting for government? How do most prominent good private universities exist? So we need to look for those grants apply for them. Once you get it, you do a lot of difference. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Violet. And on that note, um, I would um, hope that AAU has consolidated those grants that people can go and, uh, and access. There's a, an interesting question about um, the gender aspects on the studies that have come out. So to you, Samuel and Trin, uh, briefly, were there any gender issues that came out of your studies? I can be very brief here, Pauline, because we, we collected data from the institutional perspective and we, we were not able to collect uh, data uh, divided by gender. So we, we don't have any information, unfortunately, to share here. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, anything that came out? Um, yes, uh, it's kind of similar because we collected at this level, but um on on research we because i didn't really present on research but then we had gender disparity when it comes to uh research where um more women were not able to you know publish um their work due to the covid 19 pandemic and then you could see there were a lot of issues um you know taking care of the home uh as well and also taking care of the children and all that which affected their participation in research so most of the faculty members that we engage with had that issue yeah thank you quite an interesting observation there and i think uh, the person who asked that question uh, would want to pursue that it's an interesting area to pursue there's a question that is directed to dr makuku and um, dr makuku you only have have a minute to respond to it it's about the context. And I think you're the one who talked about context in your presentation. Most of the technologies that we see um, are coming from outside. Some Asian countries such as India have gone a step further and modified such technologies to suit their context. And sometimes the African context. For example, the model on, for online assessment, how can Africa higher education leverage in some of these technologies to adopt them and modify them for their local context. You uh, have thank have you a minute. very much. Yes, uh, Justin, they have a minute. Please allow me to say, despite uh, the gender component, I thought we were also going to consider students and faculty. The training for students is worrisome. It's something I need to register here. In terms of uh, um, what I've been asked, I can say that it's not true that uh, in Africa, nothing is happening. And it worries me to know that the valuable distinctions and merit dissertations and thesis done throughout uh, the universities and also in those specialist areas like the ICT, where are they? They are lying in shelves and there are people who are even employed from other continents to come and check the researches which are being done by our own people here, go there, develop them and sell them back to us. And we say they are all developed in the 
uh, developed countries. It's, it, it's not true. We need to look for them. I can give you one good example of Valley View University here in Ghana. They uh, have a rapid response team made of their students and staff and the ICT department together. That's why they didn't take two weeks to come on board because they valued what their students did and the research is the students developed the softwares, platforms and applications. So if you have that faculty, make use of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that response. Um, I, I still want to come back to you on the fourth industrial revolution. And you, you started what, talking on it. Um, what quality assurance issues that uh, you'd want to allude to when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Um, you have the final minute, Dr. Koku, because I cut you short when you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, thank you so much. I wash in the newspapers in Africa. It's always higher education, quality assurance agencies, and the industry blame game of half-baked graduates. And once we talk of half-baked graduates, it means there's some quality which is lacking. Today, we can't have a graduate who is incompetent in ICT skills, in ICT tools, which are digitalized. And so what I'm saying is, in terms of quality assurance, when we are doing accreditation of institutions, accreditation of programs, we should make sure that there are criteria to check on the preparedness of having every degree program, every course, having an ICT component attached to it so that when we do that, we are sure as they are being taught using technologies, the technology use is being transferred to them, but also there's a deliberate component that is attached to every course so that they can manage, be it music, architecture, agriculture, medicine, we need to do that deliberate move. And it's part of what we are calling quality these days because the transformation of our curricula requires us to do that for us not to have half-baked graduates. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That resonates very well with a comment that has been made by Bernard that it is indeed high time learning institutions change to blended mode of teaching and learning. This is because majority of, of the learners are teenagers who love technology. Uh, I, I presume um, teenagers in their end towards uh, the, the early adulthood at the university. And uh, they want to start working even before clearing trainings. This means that they work, they want to work and learn at the same time. Um, we are coming to the end, and I want to give you, each of you, both you and um, Dr. Uh, Kwadani, have a minute to give us a parting shot. We start with Hudson. Uh, thank you very much. I think in Zimbabwe, um, we are on the uh, right track with respect to what needs to be done. Our education now is based on three, five pillars research, community service, uh, teaching, but innovation, industrialization. Our, all what we teach must bring about innovation to bring about modernization and industrialization of our country. And to do that, we need quality assurance for both online and also, of course, for face-to-face -face blended learning. If we integrate this, so that all what we do is quality assured and our goals for development are innovation, industrialization based for modernization, I think will be on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, um, Dr. Makuku. For me, I encourage all institutions to adopt the blended approach. I also want to talk about current definition of quality assurance is constant transformation, which requires agility as one of the institutional and personal cultures, because it's the personal culture which makes the institutional culture. I want to say, if you are not agile, you remain uh, irrelevant. When you are irrelevant, you become absolute. Let's also look for those grants. 
Let's also embrace uh, the digital uh, technologies. Let's also make use of our youths who are very good, who are techno savvy, and not even uh, look at the age gap, which is a problem right now, because the young ones can teach the older ones. The older ones can teach the young ones about professionalism and others, but let's befriend the young ones so that they remove the phobia as they teach us how to navigate through. Thank you. Constant training of everyone, students and staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our dear panelists and our presenters. Thank you very much, uh, participants. I have to apologize that I've not been able to cover all the comments and questions. I tried my best to combine my good, very useful comments, very relevant questions that have come in. We want to encourage you to continue participating in our forthcoming um, webinars and carry on this conversation um, so that uh, we can try as much as possible to exhaust um, the concerns that are coming up out of the COVID-19 pandemic impact. So allow me to bring this session to an end. Uh, obviously, if we had more time, we would have continued with a lot, a lot that is coming out from our panelists and from our presenters. So I would now want to hand uh, the mic to my dear colleague, um, Dr. Martin Atella, the manager for research and policy here at PASGA to give us a vote of thanks. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Pauline. Um, <clears throat> uh, please confirm and you can hear me. We can hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you very much. Um, Colleagues and participants from across the globe, from wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, if you are uh, in East Africa. Um, Pauline has asked me to say a word of thanks to our wonderful uh, team of, of uh, panelists and contribution uh, made this webinar uh, possible. Before I do that, Please allow me to take a minute or so just to say a little bit about PASCA. Um, we heard uh, quite a bit about ESA, but we were not able to uh, tell you about PASCA. And um, in all fairness, because the webinar is hosted by the two organizations, let me take a minute to tell you a bit about this institution that we work for. Um, PASCA is a Partnership for African Social Governance Research uh, an independent Pan-African organization headquartered here in Nairobi, um, whose uh, main uh, vision and objective is to uh, work with a variety of partners across the continent and internationally to create a vibrant um, African social science community that is addressing um, uh, the continent's public policy uh, challenges. Currently, PASGA is working with partners and is, is actively engaged um, in over 15 African countries um, uh, through enhancing research, excellence in governance and public policy, and through engaging with specific organizations to ensure that the research that we do in the continent actually is used for purposes of uh, policy and programming in, in the continent. Um, so as our name suggests, we are a partnership and we are proud of this approach that we have in terms of working with, with, with individuals as well as organizations, be they individual researchers, be they higher education uh, institutions, be they think tanks, um, be they and NGOs such as ESA, civil society organizations, businesses and the private sector and community in the region and internationally. And we work very closely to support these organizations not only to produce research that is relevant, that is demand driven, um, that is responding to the needs of uh, different stakeholders in the continent, but also to support them to ensure that they can access that research, which is uh, partly um, informed by the seminar we've just had around PASCA Plus, that they can access that research, they can appraise that research, and those can also use that research for purposes of policy um, and programming. Uh, PASGA has uh, three main programs. Uh, 
contributing actively to developing an active uh, African social science community. Um, uh, research and policy, which uh, I'm privileged to lead, um, higher education and professional uh, um, development and training, which my colleague uh, Pauline is, is leading. Through these uh, three programs and through working with I mean, uh, universities across the continent, we are able to actively do four main things. One, um, establishing and sustaining partnerships nationally and regionally that an advance, advances research, that also advances uh, higher education and also advances um, uh, training. We are able to facilitate creation of uh, what we call policy communities, research and policy communities that support uptake of evidence. We are also working very hard to institutionalize uh, a research culture in the continent. And I think our panelists, including Violet, has talked about the issue of quality, which is really at the center of, 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 of the research products that we produce in the continent. And finally, through several higher education programs, which I encourage you to check our website and look, look at, we are running a master's in research um, and policy with several African universities, and also a PhD in public policy. Uh, very unique programs that I encourage participants to look through and see how they could uh, uh, benefit and um, um, you know and share with other people that might not be part of this conversation. Colleagues, allow me to express our sincere gratitude um, to a number of uh, individuals and institutions that have made this conversation possible. Starting with our presenters, um, Samuel and Trine um, uh, from ESA and uh, from the International Association of Universities, who shared with us uh, very recent um, research they've done looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the quality of higher education and delivery and learning um, across the continent. From their conversation, which uh, you know fed really well into the robust discussion uh, from our panelists, both Violet and Hadsam, a couple of things emerged. And I want to just emphasize four of them. One is the fact that whether it's blended learning, physical face-to-face, -face, or just online learning in exclusivity, quality must remain at the center. Why is this important? And I think um, our panelists and presenters have really emphasized this. The industry is yearning for a different Africa. And it is saying the quality of uh, graduates you're giving us are not meeting our expectation, which means we need as a continent to have a conversation around the quality of graduates that we're producing. And that doesn't matter whether we're doing blended learning, whether we're doing physical learning, or whether we're doing exclusive of the two options. The second thing, and I think it's um, our panelists valid to mention this, is the challenge for our higher education to be agile. That if you're not agile, uh, the world and changes around the world will bypass you, right? Um, and agility means that you're then able to reform and change and make things um, adapt, you know, as, 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 as changes occur. So COVID-19 is not sort of the framework that de decides whether you're surviving or not. But when pandemics such as COVID-19 occur, you are able to then learn quickly and adapt and do things differently. Um, I think relevant or uh, I mean uh, related to quality is the point about relevance, that whatever um, um, training we are doing in the continent really needs to be relevant to the times, but it also needs to be relevant to the context where it is delivered. And I think this is where organizations like S and PASCA become really important in partnering with our higher education to make sure that this is not just about adopting global standards without contextualizing them to what is practical in here. And the last point which I thought they really emphasize and, and which I think is, is really important is the issue around continuous learning. And for me, the important point about it was that this continuous learning is not just about our students. It is also about our teachers. It's about our lecturers. It's about our university administrators. And I say this because PASCA just finished um, implementing um, a, a very unique program, uh, PEDO, an innovative uh, pedagogical training that has really been centered around supporting delivery 
of learning using very different unique approaches. So using that and, and, and the experience that Pasca has had, we've been able to develop unique approaches to learning that I think would be useful to share uh, across the continent with other people who might be interested in, in ensuring that there's continuous learning, targeting both the lecturers and the learners as well. So allow me to really say thank you to Violet and Hudson for sharing your experiences to Samuel and Train for really sharing with us the important research that addresses this important issue about currency of learning during the pandemic. Um, moving on, please allow me to uh, thank our moderators. Um, I think I got the name right, Isel and Pauline, who have done a wonderful job keeping us on toes and in time to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, both participants and uh, uh, our panelists had the time to deliver. I know that we didn't have all, all the time to get this done, but you will agree with me that this tier does very well um, up to this point that we're able to learn a lot of important things around higher education and COVID-19. Uh, colleagues, let me uh, pass a special thanks to the organizers of this meeting, the organizations, ESA and PASCA, uh, represented here very ably by our executive directors, uh, Lucy and Anthony, who gave opening remarks and challenged us um, to really rethink our, our place in higher education and our relevance in supporting higher education in the continent. I'm very proud of the emerging and the budding relationship that ESA and PASCA is uh, building going into the future. And this being our first webinar together in a series of other webinars that are coming, I'm excited about the possibilities that the two organizations um, are able to deliver through the very able ship, uh, I mean, the, the very able leadership of um, Anthony um, and Lucy. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Lucy, for making time for this, but also for the immense support and guidance that you've given us to be able to deliver uh, this webinar. Um, there is a whole lot of uh, uh, participants who joined this meeting. We are 91 still, almost adding to the, the second hour of this meeting. Thank you for making time. It's never easy to you know, uh, juggle between our everyday work as well as joining Zoom, which has already become like a norm. Thank you for making time. We hope that you found this conversation relevant. We hope that you will join the subsequent conversations and we hope that you will share what you've learned here today with your networks and organizations. Uh, finally, uh, Pauline, let me thank the background team that is not visible um, here. The team of communication specialists, um, I think from our end, um, uh, 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 Rachel, Elijah, Joy, all who have really worked hard to make this possible. One of our panelists talked about the fact that, you know, digital learning at some point is almost equated to, you know, making, uh, providing access to Zoom and to a laptop and whether that really facilitates learning. It is very difficult in the background to make sure that this number of participants can join and the challenge is up there. So I really want to say thank you to the team of very dedicated staff who have worked with you, Pauline, and, and, and the ESSA team to make sure that this uh, 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 webinar has gone well. Thank you, wherever you are. Have a wonderful evening. We look forward to having you and sharing with you and learning from you in the next series of uh, seminars and conversations. Thank you. <laughs>